Hi everyone. We can start. Uh, I think it's about time. So today we are going to talk about the risk choice of uh, projects, open source projects that are backed by IT companies and based on a bunch of uh, different considerations that we can make uh, on these companies that are backing the project. So very quickly, why uh, will be the first point on why are we going to uh, discuss about this, why this is important. Second point, Ozzy, it's going to be a little bit into uh, software licenses, why software licenses matter and uh, some con consideration about this. Then we are going to move into the IT business models, which are uh, the IT business models, how they influence uh, the, the softwares that they, they are going to produce. Then, then some financial considerations. We are not going too deep into financial stuff, but uh, it's important to have a little bit of um, awareness about financial and how companies work. And then we are going to wrap up. So uh, about me very quickly, I've been working IT in IT since 2004, so it's 20 years at this point. Uh, and I've done a lot of different things. I've been a freelancer, I founded a few companies, worked in SMBs, big companies, large companies, any kind of companies basically. Uh, and this happened uh, in 10 different countries, uh, more than that actually, but um, so I've seen a lot of different situations and I think that by now I have a little bit a model uh, to evaluate those kind of things. Also, uh, I've w um, published a few books, uh, and I do work for Red Hat, but the fact that I do work for Red Hat is pretty much non-influential within the conversation that we are going to have today. So why this is important? And this is usually a question that I get from people that are non very technical, uh, because I mean, in the end, free software is free. So what's the problem? The problem is that free software is like free puppies. They are not really free if you adopt them. Because even though the software is free, the fact that you then engineer your organization around that software implies that changing that software becomes a huge cost. So moving on what software licenses are, I think everyone knows this uh, here. So very quickly, uh, software licenses are uh, what allows uh, you to distribute um, the the, the, the software uh, itself in a way that is safe for you from a financial standpoint or a risk standpoint. Um, and the reality is that not all licenses are the same, obviously. Uh, and they, are, they can be placed into a spectrum. In one right, uh, well, left side for you, um, the side you have the all rights waived uh, kind of licenses. So effectively those licenses that allows you to do whatever you want. On the opposite side, the right side, is all rights are served. So those licenses are obviously the ones that are really strict on what you can do or not do. And this is not really a continuum. I mean, it's a continuum in theory, but in the reality of, uh, of the world, it's not. Because obviously it would be very complex uh, to then discuss about such a continuum because every single case would be very different. So to make l our life simpler, we are going to divide this in a few different categories. The first one is the public domain. Public domain is something that you don't really release into the public domain uh, by definition, but it's something that after a while uh, the, the work of arts, which software is part of in the majority of uh, legislation, end up being now, there are some licenses that are defined as public domain licenses because they emulate the public domain, uh, but they are not really public domain. But in this block, we are going to put all those licenses that basically allow you to do whatever you want with that software or work of art. The second category is the non-protective open source licenses. This means that those are open source licenses, so they have some caveats uh, attached to, to their use or their de redistribution, but still they don't really protect that much. The third category are the protective open source licenses, uh, which are open source licenses that you know are open source, so they respect all the four freedoms, but they do 
ha dictate a lot more on what you can do uh, mainly in uh, redistributing that software. The fourth category is proprietary licenses, uh, which is uh, of the majority of commercial software would fall into that category. And the fifth category is the trade secret. Trade secret is not really a software license category, uh, but if you think about uh, this model, you can apply this to any kind of knowledge. So the Coca-Cola uh, Coca formula, for instance, would be into the latest car, uh, category. And the reason why trade secrets are so important is that every software or any work of uh, your mind that will end up in the first four categories, uh, over time will finish, uh, will end up into the first one, in the public domain one. There are different amount of times based on the specific uh, country or jurisdiction you are into, uh, but everything you release, uh, it, it's going to become at a certain point public domain. But trade secrets are not released, therefore they don't have this shortcoming. Now, this is probably very straightforward, but it does not really apply directly into software because you cannot say, oh, I want to release my software into the proprietary license because there is not one proprietary license. But we do have many licenses that you can pick from. So a few examples um, are those. So as you can see, I've placed MIT, for instance, uh, very, very close to the public domain one because uh, of the uh, as we were saying, MIT license is that a kind of license that tell you, you know, you do whatever you want uh, with the software. Um, so it's basically a public domain, but it's not really public domain. And then you can see that there are licenses that are throughout the spectrum up to the proprietary one. Now, I would like to point out the fact that obviously there are many more licenses. Uh, there are hundreds of open source licenses and more than hundreds of non-open source licenses. Um, but those are probably all names that you have already seen. And I think it's very interesting to notice that, for instance, the CC uh, by NC, which is under proprietary license uh, over here, um, is not really an open source license, even though it's a CC. Uh, so if you assume that CC equals open source, that's not really the case. It really depends which CC, because we, we can find one here, one here, and one there. So it's very important to really understand which license um, you are talking uh, about when you are adopting, for instance, a piece of software. Now, there is also the business uh, software license, BUSL, or someone calls it BSL, but BSL is actually the boost um, um, software license. Uh, but the BUSL, is now fairly common for many projects that are scared that someone will steal their uh, software and then run with, with it on some cloud providers and so on. Uh, but that's not an open source license, just to be very clear. Now, it's also very important to be aware exactly on the license because sometimes that it's okay to use a license that has some uh, constraints. So for instance, let's say the GPL and the AGPL. Those two licenses are obviously not at the same place because the AGPL will impose that even if you are uh, you if you are delivering your software as a service, then you are still um, um, under uh, the requirements of the AGPL for releasing the code. While for GPL, that does not apply. Now. It's very important to know the difference because if you are not releasing the software as a service, the two licenses are exactly the same. So it's important to understand what the software that you are going to use requires you to do and what you want to do. Because sometimes it's going to be a, a limitation for you. In other ca cases, it, it will not be of any limitation for you. Now, the fact that there is a software under certain license, though, does not guarantee you that it will be on the same license throughout the whole life of the project. And that's usually the problem. Because if I start today with a software under business uh, software license, and I'm fine with the terms of business software license, I'm OK, as long as this software is under business software license. I don't have an issue. The issue, though, usually happens with the fact that 
a lot of software start with one software license and then for some reason into their life they change software license. Now for some software this is easier to do, for others it's harder. Uh, the, the, my thumb rule is if there is a big community and no uh, community agreement uh, where basically you are giving away your rights on the, um, the, the commits that you are doing into it, then the risk is very low. So the kernel, Linux kernel, is an example of this. Uh, to change the um, license of the Linux kernel, there would be a requirement of tens of thousands of people, all of them uh, agreeing on changing the license and to the new license, and that is unpractical, at least. And that's, for instance, the one of the reasons why the uh, Linux kernel is not under GPL version 3, but is only under version 2. Because even if someone wanted to do that change, and maybe there are some people that do want to it, do it, uh, they have to make sure that everyone that they have ever committed to the kernel agrees with the change, which might be not very easy to do. But if the software is uh, developed by a single company, then it's way easier for that company to actually change the, um, the model. Uh, or if there are maybe some external contributors, but still that they have waived the rights to that specific company to uh, allow them to eventually change license uh, over the course of the life of the software. So in those cases, it's very important to understand what's the model, the business model of the company behind. What's, what are their motives to do what they do? So, first of all, I want to make a disclaimer before this section, which is that not everything in a model, uh, in a theoretical model, really map to reality. And in some cases, they map better to certain parts of an organization more than the whole organization. Because if you think about big organizations, usually they do a lot of different, uh, they have different models within the organization itself. Um, but going uh, into the various kinds of uh, comp IT companies we can find, the first one is the software vendor. So this is probably the IT software company uh, th that everyone have in their minds. Uh, those are companies that sell software, usually in boxes, maybe virtual boxes nowadays, uh, but they, they are the companies that basically could sell you a CD. An example of these are Apple, Microsoft, NVIDIA, Aussie. Uh, for those companies, such as Apple, I'm not talking about the hardware part, also the software part. Uh, for Microsoft, Windows and Office mostly, uh, the Azure stuff, it's obviously a completely different business model. But, you know, to give you an idea, those are companies that sell you software. So the way they earn money is because they sold you the software. So if one of those companies um, gives you um, software for free, obviously it might be a little bit suspicious. In some cases it's okay. So if you think about NVIDIA, for instance, their real business model is selling hardware card, not really software. So they could decide to give all the software part for free because still you are going to buy their hardware cards. Now there is one small caveat here, which is if their software is very good and is open source, then you might decide to run their software on someone else's uh, graphic cards, which might not be what they want. And that's why, for instance, why I think personally that NVIDIA is not so happy about releasing the whole stack because they want to be sure that at least some parts are still st very sticky with their hardware and not maybe AMD or you know someone else. So if uh, you are um, a software vendor, in the other hand, it's also true that for you licenses are very important and GPL-like licenses are very problematic. And that's why, for instance, some of those companies are not accepting any software that is GPL version 3. So for instance, that's why uh, Apple, for instance, releases with a version of Bash that is very old, because it's the oldest, uh, the newest, sorry, uh, ver um, GPL version 2 Bash, uh, but it's still very old, because in the meantime, Bash moved to uh, GPL v3. So they are very risk aware um, to, to licenses for those reasons, because in the end, pretty much all licenses, all GPL licenses, for instance, 
uh, they really regulate how you distribute software. And since they are software distributors, then it's, it becomes very important for them. There is then the concept of everything as a service uh, kind of companies. Uh, so those are companies that provide some kind of resource uh, to you as a service. Uh, this can be software as a service, platform as a service, and so on. Uh, examples would be Adobe, for instance, with Creative Cloud, that's a software as a service. WS is infrastructure as a service. GCP is infrastructure as a service as well. So those kind of companies, um, they earn money by basically renting those services to their customers, which means that in the end, the important part for them is that the software run on their stuff. It's not that important uh, that you buy their things uh, as long as you are running there. So in those kind of companies, you can find uh, some cases where they are very open at releasing things. In other cases, they might be a little bit less open. Uh, but on general uh, terms, those companies tend to have less issues than the, the software vendors to release software. Um, and from their perspective, the licenses are a risk still, but not that huge a risk. Because as long as they stay away from a GPL software, they can do whatever they want. Because GPL, for instance, that's not really a regulament, they, their use case, a GPL even less. Another option is what I call layered uh, service providers. Because they are service providers, but they don't provide you so, uh, software. So those are companies that provide additional services on top of software stuff. So consulting would be one, uh, support, training, certifications, whatever you want. Uh, those can be first party, third party. Basically, if uh, you have uh, something like uh, Cisco Academy, for instance, um, they provide uh, certification and trainings on Cisco stuff, so it's kind of first party because it's still the same company. Pluralsight, in the other hand, it, pro it provides uh, training and um, various other kind of training like services uh, to companies, but it's not on their products, it's on other people's products. And then you have Red Hat, for instance, as an example here, uh, we provide software, um, sorry, uh, we provide consulting, support, training, and certification on the software, but the software is not what we really sell. So, the way they earn uh, money is basically uh, uh, their uh, customers pay for that service, could be a one-time uh, service, for instance, for a certification or a training course, uh, or it could be also longer term. You could have like a contract agreement for support or uh, a yearly long uh, contract for trainings, those kind of things. And those kind of companies usually do not make money with software. So for them, releasing software for free is okay as long as you, know, you buy their additional services on top of it. But that's usually a fairly um, agreed uh, thing. So it, it does work. Um, for them, and usually in this category, you will find a lot of companies that release uh, open source software. For them, the, the risk of licenses is low, because in the end, they are not distributing software at all. So whatever is the requirement of the license, they are not distributing it, so they don't really care that much about licenses. There is then another aspect. Uh, another case, which is the more traditional kind of service providers, and those are companies that provide traditional services, but improved by IT or helped by IT. Example of these would be Uber, Airbnb. I mean, Uber is taxes, basically. Airbnb is hotels, uh, but they do it with IT, so they are a better company uh, due to that. And for them. The earning source is the customer that pay for a non-IT service. You pay Uber for being carried around your city, not really for their IT stack. So they don't really care at all about the software part. For them, it's not a value to keep that software closed source. If not, the very small parts that are uh, also critical to their business and differentiating uh, for you know uh, from the competitor uh, competition and the license risk is very, very low. There are some caveats here because some companies are more strict than others on this, but 
still the risk for them is fairly low. And then there is the, the fifth category, which is time sellers. Time sellers are probably the biggest part of IT companies, uh, speaking about number of people employed. And those are basically people that provide their employees time and knowledge to other companies. So those are basically consulting firms. In real TCS, we pro many others. But it's a like companies that sell people. They sell people, they don't sell software. So for them, in theory, it would be not a problem to give um, software away because, as I said, they get money for people. Now, there is a big asterisk here because do usually those companies are not so happy about releasing software. Uh, and the reason is that if they don't release the software, they can sell the same solution to many customers, um, which sometimes they do. Uh, so obviously they might be less happy about releasing the software itself. And for them, the, uh, the license risk is very, very low. Now, if you arrive up to here, it's like, okay, many companies can release software, but not that many actually do. And then we are not really explaining why some companies at a certain point, they change license. And the reason for all of this is in the financial part. There are two concepts that are critical to understand, to understand companies. The first one is that companies need to make money. That's the whole point about a company. So if a company is losing money, it's not a good company. If a company is making money, then obviously it's a good company. And the second aspect is that company in the end need to fulfill their owners or shareholders expectations. So in theory, based on the previous statement, you could say, okay, th this foundation is losing money, therefore it's a bad company. Yeah, that's true, but the point is that their shareholders or owners actually don't want to make money, so that's fine. Uh, but still, they have to go at least at zero, otherwise you have uh, financial issues. So this is a critical aspect. So companies make whatever their owners like them to make. And the reason why I'm saying this is because uh, I have a couple of examples for you on what are the implications of this. The first one is the QT company. Uh, who knows about QT or Qt? Okay, a bunch. This is a graphical library uh, for C++. It allows you to do nice web uh, user interfaces and Kiri, for instance, is fully made with Qt. So the, the Qt company is a type one kind of uh, company. It sells software, basically. Uh, they are selling the, the Qt itself. It's founded in 1994 as Trolltech and had a very weird history, including one IPO, delisting, a few acquisitions here and there. Um, weird history. Uh, but um, from 94 to 98, they tried to understand how to make a software that was both open source and commercial. It did not really work the first few times. In the end, it worked out properly. And at the moment, uh, since 1998, it's double licensed GPL plus commercial, which means that basically if you are going to release your software as GPL or GPL compatible licenses, then you can use the GPL version of Qt and therefore it's free for you. Uh, but if you want to embed it in other ways, then you have to buy the commercial version and they are earning money on that. And if we look at uh, their financial statement of 2022, what we can see is that they have 600 employees. So it's not like fi five people, it's like a, a reasonable amount of people. Uh, they had a revenue for $155 million uh, and then a, an operating profit of roughly $35, $36 million, which means that they are making money. Probably they are owners are also happy. So this model works. Now, another case study. This is about HashiCorp. By the way, I, I will arrive to the history of HashiCorp up to a year ago. Whatever happened in the last year, I don't know, I don't want to know, I will not comment on anything about that. Okay? Uh, both of them. I don't know and 
we will maybe comment about this uh, next year or in few years time but not today and the, the reason is that it's very hard to comment and understand what are the implications of something that just happened while if we go back a year time we it's better uh, it's easier to understand what happened and why those are still a type one company so they are selling software like Qt they got founded in 2012, so it's slightly younger than uh, QT company as well. They had six VC, venture capitalist rounds. So they had a seed round of 1 million in 2013 with a valuation of 5 million, and then 2014, first round, uh, round A, valuation of 50 million, then 250 million, 500 million, 1.9 billion. 4.9 billion the, uh, the last round and this actually makes sense and the reason is that every time you have venture capitalists there is a table basically that basi uh, based on the round that you are doing that's the amount of money that your venture capitalist that is going to give you money is expecting to make and the numbers are those so for a seed investment is 10 to 20x in fact if you look from the seed to a, we move from 5 to 50 million, so that's at an X. And then uh, it goes a little bit down, obviously, because the company becomes bigger and bigger. Uh, but if you look at the various numbers of HashiCorp, they are all of them within this range, which is great. And then they IPO'd at $80 per, uh, per, per share at an evaluation of 16 billion, so still from the last round, 4.9 billion to 16 billion, that's a 3 point something per, uh, X. We are still in the 2 to 5 range, that's perfect. And then we have, you know, a few years later, well, two years later, we look the their statement and we see that they have 2,400 2, employees, which is four times cute, basically. Total revenue of 143 million, which is less than what Qt was making and therefore obviously a total loss uh, an operating loss sorry of 196 millions and that lo uh, and a net loss uh, so that the, the real uh, loss of 66 million um, so the stock uh, after I don't know 1.5 years closed at $25 so obviously the market cap was way down, it was 5.5 billion. So that means that if someone invested the day of the IPO and then, you know, on the 9th of August 2023, would have been way in the uh, red. What happened the day after? They li changed license. If you think about this, it's normal because the company was not performing. So the owners were not happy about. The, the fact that, you know, the, the company was not providing what they were promised. Because the reality is that every owner and every shareholder is a partial owner of the company um, wants to make money, wants their company to make money. So if a company burns so much money uh, of their owners uh, throughout 1.5 years, they will not be happy. So Although obviously I was not present I in the rooms uh, with the CEO uh, and I don't know exactly which conversation he had, I'm sure that many people pointed him to the direction of this is not working, you need to make more money. Now obviously his solution was like let's change license and then from there we will make more money um, and we will see in the coming years if that actually worked or not. But it's very critical to understand the fact that the company that you are sourcing your software from needs to be healthy. If the company that you are sourcing your software from is not healthy, they will do something to become more healthy, which might be aligned with what you want or might not. So wrapping up, uh, first of all, not all licenses are the same. Some are better for the distributors, some are better for redistributors, others are better for users, it really depends. Open source can be easier for some business models. Um, 
software vendors obviously are probably the, the hardest one. Uh, for others, is easier. A failing company is not a good company because at a certain point something will happen. Otherwise, I, I, either they fail or something will happen to try not to fail. Uh, and a company needs to uh, fulfill their investor will. In the end, free software is like free puppies. Adopting them is not really free. So be very careful when you adopt the software on all everything that is around the software itself. Is this really a sustainable business for the company behind it? Is this sustainable business for the, comp the person behind it if it's a one-person project? Because in the end, it's either sustainable for everyone or it will change over time. So, thanks a lot. If you have questions, we still have a few minutes. <laughs> yep. Yes. Yeah, so the question is about SUSE, uh, how that this whole conversation applies to SUSE. I think that SUSE is one of those companies, as mentioned, as you mentioned, that have a very weird history. Uh, there are some periods of time where they grow a lot, uh, other periods of time where they did not really. Uh, they got bought and sold a few times. Um, then they IPO'd and then they, they listed as well. Uh, so it's one of those situations where I would be a little bit concerned uh, using a software developed by SUSE, exclusively by SUSE, because maybe tomorrow something will change, or maybe not. No one knows. Some companies go very well and then they get bought and then they change completely. Other companies go very badly and then they, uh, they sell and they change completely. It's very hard to say, oh, this is not a science. But if a company has shaky results, not consistent growth, then it's a possible acquisition target for other kind of companies that will not try to uh, increase the size of the company, but will try to divide the company or optimize cost or those kind of things. But it, you know, no one has a crystal balls. Yes. 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 So um, the comment was about CLA and how those uh, interact with this, and surely they are critical because if a CLA is in place, so there is one entity that has all that right of changing the licenses, then the risk goes way up. If there is no CLA in place or there are other mitigation contracts in place, then the risk goes down. Uh, and for instance, SUSE Linux, it's not really owned by SUSE, so SUSE cannot change the license of SUSE Linux uh, or OpenSUSE for instance. Uh, so in the end, obviously the risk there is very, very limited because the, there is not that risk. Yes? So the question is about copyright expiration uh, time uh, and what's the implication uh, for software? Yeah, yeah, practical implication for software. So at the moment, it really depends on the country you're in. Uh, it goes from 20 to 80 years. Uh, so obviously, in the countries where the limit is 80 years, makes no sense for software. Uh, I would argue 20 years make very limited sense for software still. 
um, the problem is that the whole copyright has not been thought out for software, but has been thought out for uh, other form of art. So uh, paints, uh, movies, uh, music, and so on. So obviously, while a, a song that has 20 years still makes sense uh, to release it in public domain, a software that has 20 years makes less sense. So I think that in the specific case uh, of uh, software, that will not be that important. Thank you.